The next tip, and one I struggle with the most, is set a budget and stick to it. And I'm just letting you know in advance, this is a hardcore wine geek episode. So this guy, John, attorney Sam, started coming into my feed about six, seven months ago. And at first when I watched them, I was upset. I was like, God, this guy is so monotone. He's not even looking in the camera. I'm gonna be talking about 12 things to consider when collecting wine. But people, he's getting views. Why are people liking these videos? Then I sucked up my ego. I took a look to see what was working. He was doing a hell of a job. He was researching a ton, taking it, condensing it down to 10, 12 minutes and making it consumable and easy for people. That's how you win on YouTube. Then I actually had a call with him. I sat down and I talked with him, realized he's a hell of a guy. After that, I realized I'm the asshole. This is his most viewed video on YouTube, Wine Collecting 101. I've seen a lot of his videos. I have never seen this video yet. The first item to consider is your goal when purchasing wine. Are you collecting for investment purposes or for personal use? Personal use standpoint, that's where, I, that's where I stand by. Okay, point one, let's get to it. Or some combination of those two items. The answer to those questions will heavily dictate and influence your purchasing strategy. Of course, if you buy for personal use, the wines that you purchase still could increase in value, but if you're likely just going to be consuming them on your own, that's not necessarily gonna be so important. If, however, you're purchasing for investment purposes, you're gonna to wanna to focus on the real high blue chip type wines. If you just wanna collect wines to enjoy, just buy what you like, buy what you enjoy drinking. I see a lot of people buying what they think they should enjoy and then end up with a cellar full of wines that they don't even wanna drink. Blue chip wines, wines with brand names are ones that always go up in value. These would include things like First nice Growth pictures. Bordeaux, High End Burgundy from producers like DRC and Loire, Penfolds Grange, Vega Sicilia, some of the high end Napa wines, uh, the Super Tuscans such as Ornelia and Sassicaia, and things of that nature. Okay, for point one, I think he's right on a lot of things. However, I see a lot of times in the collecting circles that Napa wines don't necessarily hold their value like Class Bordeaux, like Burgundy, like some of those Super Tuscan wines like Ornelina, Tignanello, Celaya, Masetto. A lot of producers don't like to admit in California and Napa, when you go on auction sites, when you go find older vintages of Napa Cab, the older vintages are sometimes cheaper than the newer releases. The second item to consider is proper storage. Proper storage is absolutely critical. Ideally, your wines would be kept at around 55 degrees Fahrenheit, which is around 12 or 13 degrees Celsius. You should also keep them in an area that doesn't get excess light, or have any vibration, as those can also damage the wine. You have two primary options with storage. You can either store at home by building out a cellar or purchasing a standalone unit, or you can go off-site. Each of these items have pros and cons. If you're doing it at home, you'll have substantial initial expense to build out a cellar or to purchase the storage unit, but you won't have any recurring expenses and the wine will always be readily available whenever you want it, which can be both a good thing and a bad thing. If you go off-site, <laughs> you're not gonna have the initial upfront expense Expense, but you will have recurring expenses on a monthly basis. Of course, if you're building a home cellar, one thing that you should definitely consider is however much space you need, it most likely won't be enough. Everyone I speak to who's built a cellar at home, including myself, always wishes that they made it probably at least twice as big as they did. Everyone invariably runs out of space, and for my unit, for example, I have things piled up all over the floor, and it's hard for me to even get in there to get what I need to get. So that makes it challenging. So definitely make sure that you err on the side of caution and make your storage as big as you possibly can if you're doing it at home. I see this with a lot of my wine collecting friends. First of all, with with my wine, my storage, if you know, I, I'm traveling all the time, especially the last seven years, I really haven't had a house. So I get all my, you know, wines that I like to collect sent to my parents' house because they have a proper bomb shelter. It's dark, there's no light, it's humid, it's underground, it's a proper cellar. And I found wines that have actually corvin and then stuck in the cellar, they hold really well because the cellaring conditions are perfect. I don't think you can beat natural underground conditions, but not everybody has that luxury. Off-site locations, great. Big business in some big time cities. I have friends in New York City, when I lived in Singapore, that have off-site facilities. What happens is they can actually, the facilities can actually send you your own wine if you want it, but then it takes a little bit of time or you have to go and pick it up. Sometimes guys overbuy because they don't want to go back to their cellar and get stuff or go through the steps. They just end up buying more and more wine. So that can be a bit of a problem. And then running out of cellar space, I have a good friend. <laughs> 
<laughs> he's, a, he's Croatian, he actually used to live in New York, then he's moved out to Washington. I remember visiting his house uh, in New York and he's trying to get into his cellar and I was like, oh, it's really cold in here. He's like, yeah, I know, I just can't reach the temperature control because the cellar was just stocked from the bottom up to the top. So that's something to keep in mind. The fourth point is to know what you like and be sure to diversify. Oftentimes people will make the mistake of starting with one region that they like and then just buying substantial quantities of that one region. But as their wine tasting progresses over the years, you discover new regions and new wines that you like and you become exposed to new things and then you want to get those wines as well. Your cellar is imbalanced and doesn't match your drinking preferences. Knowing your palate is the same thing as just knowing yourself. I know I don't enjoy Napa cabs. I don't enjoy cellaring Napa cabs in terms of drinking them on an everyday basis. So I shouldn't be buying a lot of them. If I would have started collecting wine years and years ago when I didn't know as much, I might think, you know what? I got to collect the cult Cabernet Sauvignons, the big cabs. I'm glad I didn't because then I'd have a cellar full of wines that I don't even really enjoy. That actually happened to me. I learned the hard way. For the first several years of my wine tasting career, I loaded up heavily on California wines. But then several years later, I discovered France, including Bordeaux and Rhone and Champagne, and then Italy and Spain and other regions as well. Right from the horse's mouth, same thing happened to John. You should also make sure that you try a lot of different wine in a lot of different regions before you start making substantial purchases. You should also be sure to taste some aged wines because the whole point of collecting is to be able to age wines and enjoy them when they improve later on. There are some people, however, who do not like aged wines. He hit the nail on the head. If you really not want to know about wine, if you want wine that you actually enjoy, you have to taste, 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 taste until you learn your own palate. This is especially true for champagne. And there's many people that I know and, and taste with regularly whose palates I respect who simply don't appreciate or enjoy aged champagne. That's another point, drinking aged wines. I used to love mature aged wines. As I get more and more into the wine world, I've started to realize that I prefer to drink wines on the younger side. Even the classics like Bordeaux, Piemonte, it's just I'm more disappointed with old wines than I am pleased. The only difficult thing is when you drink a perfect wine at the perfect time, it's like catching lightning in a bottle and it's like a really ethereal, almost orgasmic experience but you're always chasing that high and it's hard to replicate okay I don't have a lot of experience with the great red burgundy so I'm not gonna speak in bullshit here but I think Bordeaux is the one wine red Bordeaux that really is designed to age and that really improves with time a lot of wines don't really improve with time they get to a certain point and yeah they can age longer but they'll stay they won't improve on the other hand there's people like myself and some other friends that I have who think it's one of the most amazing things in the entire world and and without having that experience yourself, you're not able to make that decision on an informed basis. The sixth tip is seller defenders. Cellar defenders are crucial. What is a cellar defender? A cellar defender is a wine that's going to be ready to drink early on and which you can enjoy immediately so that you're not tempted to raid your cellar. I never knew he has his cellar defender series. I never knew what cellar defenders was until just then. I actually love that term, I love that concept. I prefer actually to drink these cellar defender wines because they're usually lower in price. And if you find a good producer, you drink their mid range or their entry level wine, it brings you just as much enjoyment as some of their top level wines. Examples of cellar defenders include non-vintage champagne, which could protect your vintage champagne. You could have second labels from Bordeaux producers, Lang Nabiolo. He's right on the money when he talks about non-vintage champagne, big houses, good champagnes are excellent. When you go to Rome, if you like geeky wines like Hermitage, Cote Roti, Crow's Hermitage, I think offers tremendous value for money, Syrah-based wine. I'm gonna pick on John a little bit here. In Piemonte, you have Barolo Barbaresco, then you have two different Nebbiolos, Lange Nebbiolo and Nebbiola d'Alba. Lange Nebbiolo, the grapes are of lower quality. Nebbiola d'Alba, but is a higher quality wine. So I would stock up on those. Some of my favorite cellar defenders include Chateauneuf de Pop and also Rioja. Rioja is very good because 
they age it for a substantial amount of time at the winery before release. So you often get the benefit of having an aged wine. Shot enough to pop is a wine that's designed to be enjoyed young. I think that's why Robert Parker liked it so much. It's a region that I have extensive experience in. I'm there often. I actually prefer to drink Shot enough to pop on the younger side. And I've never met somebody that's new to wine and when I give them Shot enough for the first time, not like it. They always enjoy it. Rioja in Spain, also tremendous value for money. If you want to learn about old wine, you want to get a taste of old wine, you need to go to Rioja because the wines are already aged. You can buy them at great price points so you can start to learn if you like that flavor. Some of my favorite producers of Chateauneuf de Pop include uh, Domaine Pagao or Pago, depending on how you pronounce it. Even the family pronounces it two different ways. Ah! <laughs> he got it! He got it! It is pronounced either Pagao or Pago, depending on the dialect. Of course, Beaucastel and Janas are two other options that I enjoy as well. Good, good, safe choices, Beaucastel and Janas, but You've seen some of my Chateauneuf videos. I'll pin them in the link below. I think there are some excellent producers that to me, I enjoy more than those last two that he recommended. The seventh tip to consider is that it's oftentimes useful to buy in quantities of three or six, but not 12. Unless you know that you really, really, really love a wine. Like for me, I love Chianti Classico, Chianti Classico Reserva. I would buy those by the 12 pack, but you know what? I'd probably just drink all of them right away. <laughs> The next item for you to consider is your time horizon. Are you impatient? How much time do you have to age the wines before you want to be able to drink them? <laughs> Look how he says, time horizon. I've met John now, and I think he's got a dry, smart sense of humor. That also means maybe life expectancy. <laughs> I see some people in the past where I was living in Singapore had way too many wines, more wines than they could actually drink in their life. I've met some friends in New Jersey that actually were starting to drink down their cellars. They're a little bit older. You know, their time horizon is a little bit shorter. And some of their cellars are empty because they said, I've stopped buying, I started selling off, and I started drinking the wines. The general rule he's talking about here is if you buy a case of 12, three, you're gonna drink too young, six, you're gonna drink on the way up to the peak, maybe a little bit on the way down, and three, you're gonna drink too old. There you go, that's the general rule. The next tip is to be patient. I know it's difficult to lay off those wines, and if you let them evolve and improve with age, they can develop some very intriguing tertiary notes and become far more complex. Another tip is to get some cellar management software. I personally use Cellar Tracker, and I have the Corks app, which works great when I'm on the road, but it's absolutely essential to have cellar management software because once your collection gets big, there's no way you could possibly keep track of all those things manually. <laughs> I seen some of my friends, hardcore people, spreadsheets. Fortunately, my cell, my cell is only a few hundred bottles, so I can go and look and see. But I've seen people with thousand bottle sellers have spreadsheets, seller tracker. I don't use seller tracker as often as I should, even though one of my friends is actually on the team. There's it's a small team of people. Sorry, Andrew. Maybe in the future. The next tip, and one I struggle with the most, is set a budget and stick to it. This is incredibly difficult because you oftentimes get presented with offers that you don't expect, and it's sometimes very difficult to avoid making additional purchases on the fly. Oh, wow. I see that all the time. When we like, and even me in my previous life, I was, you know, baller status. I'm not <laughs> that right now because I'm doing YouTube and I'm doing wine YouTube. Hopefully soon though, again, wine people, they always overspend because it's always exciting to buy new wines, find new wines, try new wines, offers come up. It's just like if you're a real estate tycoon, there's offers that come up that you absolutely can't refuse. Same that comes in wine. The last tip is to go heavy in top vintages. Once you've tasted thoroughly and you know yourself and your preferences, when you get a good vintage, it's definitely worthwhile loading up on that particular vintage, especially from your favorite producers. These are the wines that tend to age better. They're also the best wines from those producers. And if you do need to sell them, they're also going to be easier to sell. As some examples, the 2012 vintage in Champagne is really, really outstanding. And so that's one to keep an eye on. Additionally, in Bordeaux, 2016 and 2018 are very strong. In Napa, 2018 is strong. In Piedmont, 2016 is exceptional and actually throughout Italy. It's like buying blue chip stocks. You buy great vintages of brands you know will appreciate and value. I agree with them completely on 12 Champagne, 16 and 18 Bordeaux and 18 Napa. In fact, I have a video, 18 California Cab versus 18 Grand Cru Bordeaux coming up soon.
2016, I recommend loading up on anywhere throughout Europe, wines that you can sell her or wines that you can drink. And that being said, all the 2019s I've tasted, I think follow along the same lines. I'm gonna be doing more collabs with John. I actually did one on his channel titled This or That. I have it right up there. I'll throw the link in the description box below. Let me know, do you collect wine for investment or just to enjoy? Or you say, screw it. I just wanna drink all my wines. Let me know in the comments below. Thanks a lot. I'll see you soon.